You have to be fast in hiring people. You have to be fast in uh, in making decisions. You have to be fast in executing on your marketing, executing on your you know your product releases. You just have to you have to match your actions with your strategy. Mike Cassidy, thank you for joining me on 20 Minute Leaders. How are you? Good. How are you? It is such an honor and privilege to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me. I know how incredibly busy you are, uh, and, I, and I really appreciate it. I'm excited to talk to you these 20 minutes about really your journey and your outlook on, on startups, on deep technology, on making an impact. Mike, you're, uh, besides the fact that you are a VP at Google and ran Project Loon, which is one of my all-time favorite uh, tech projects that I've ever seen with trying to provide internet to billions of people through balloons. Uh, you're also a you're serial entrepreneur with multiple startups behind you. I believe one of them started with $500 that you and your co-founders put in. Uh, so I'd love to hear that story. Uh, and today you're running Apollo Fusion, which I can't wait to hear about what it is. But Mike, let's get started with, with real passion, which is the fact that you've released two jazz albums. How does that work <laughs> with uh, with everything else that I was saying? <laughs> um, so I love a change of pace. And um, between when I do startups, between the startups, I try to do something fun. And uh, for one year between startups, I was an entrepreneur in residence at Benchmark. Um, but a different year, uh, I went to Berkeley College of Music. And when I was there, I studied jazz piano and studied what it takes to uh, record and uh, produce uh, records. And, uh, and so I had fun doing that. Wow. Unbelievable. What, what is it about jazz that attracted you? And I have to ask this question because I've already met multiple really, in, really incredible people from the Texan that are just really love jazz. My father being one of them. So what, what is it about jazz that really excites you? Um, I mean, the improvisation part is really fun, I think. So it's, you know, it's not like the same song all the time. When you get into the improv section, you're hearing something new every time. And the act of improvisation, I think, is it's a great challenge. Uh, you know, you're, you've got the chords and then in real time, you're trying to make up a melody that fits with the chords and fits in with what the people around you are playing. There's also kind of a camaraderie to, to jazz playing in a, in a combo that there is in, in a, you know, a startup. You you're listening to what every person in the combo is doing and, and you're playing off them and they're playing off you. And, and I just, it's very fun for me. I love it. I think one of the first things that I was always inspired about jazz when I started playing saxophone very young was the idea that you have this, both the harmony at one point where everybody's playing together, but then at some point you're also giving, giving the stage to individual people to showcase their creativity and you're supporting them uh, and you're, you're continuing to play, but, but consciously supporting them so that they are at the forefront and giving them that chance. So I think, I think that's just wonderful. Mike, take me back. To, to the young days, studying aerospace engineering at, at MIT, going then uh, to Harvard, I believe. But what, what, is, what, do you, what is the trajectory that you hope for yourself along the way? What do you imagine yourself doing later on in life? Well, in the beginning, I wanted to be an astronaut, um, but that didn't really? really work out. Yes, <laughs> um, but sort of next best thing was, um, was, I guess, being an aerospace engineer, and I love being an aerospace engineer. Um, and I started off at this place, Hughes Aircraft Company, working on um, you know, satellites and launch vehicles and a solar powered race car. Um, um, but part of that process was me kind of feeling like sort of the aerospace industry in those days at least was very big and not the fastest moving. And it didn't feel like you could have a huge impact personally on like starting up a startup that would then turn into a big, a big company in the aerospace industry. So I kind of wanted to do a startup in a different industry where a company could get a lot of traction and move a lot faster. 
Really? So, I mean, you're talking about how about speed and about the, the pace of the industry, uh, which resonates interesting. I, I'd like, I'd love to talk soon about uh, speed as the primary business strategy uh, slideshow that, that you talked about. But take me to the days of Stylus. You're starting out with your co-founders. You're putting in $500 each, uh, a company that, that takes off pretty quickly. What was that journey like? Give me a little bit of, of, of the back of the back end story. Yeah. So uh, we were definitely capital constrained, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> we, we had we had fifteen hundred dollars plus. We won the MIT uh, business plan competition, which was a ten thousand dollar prize. So we had eleven thousand five hundred dollars, um, and it really forced us to be. What did they say? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I mean, every every right. step of the way, we had to be super frugal, super careful. Um, and as we launched this this software product. Um, we literally every day on the wall, we put how much, how much profit did we make today? We didn't put what our sales, were, how much profit did we make? And we sort of trained our whole company, Wow. focus on profit. And then we would make little rules for ourselves. Like, okay, before we can hire a tech support person, we need to have uh, three weeks where the total profit each week is at least $10,000. And then once that happened, we'd okay, okay, now I can hire a tech support person. And that, I think that discipline helped the whole company focus on the right things. How do you how do you focus on that discipline? Because it, it sounds to me from talking to a lot of young entrepreneurs and looking at myself, that's one of the hardest things to do is to have that bigger picture, that vision, overarching strategy of understanding what it'll take to to continue growing. Where, where do you get that discipline at at such an early time? This is, I believe, one of the first the first endeavors that you run by yourself, right? Well, I, I think it was kind of forced on us. I mean, we were like um, had to focus on the fundamentals. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, who, who is going to buy, we, we had this idea for a piece of software, a software tool, who is going to buy it? We sort of figured we had some ideas on that. And then what is our sort of marketing distribution channel? And it was very simple for us. There was a computer telephony journal, with one magazine that was focused on computer telephony. And then there was something called visual basic programmers journal, uh, basically a medium for people who are using visual basic and our tool was a visual basic tool to do computer telephony. So we focused on those two channels mm -hmm. and we focused on like, like PR. We were got, we got on the cover of computer telephony magazine twice over the course of a, wow. about a year. We focused on basic advertising. We would take out a, you know, a thousand dollar ad in, in one of these magazines and we would see, okay, we, we got $3,000 back. Okay. Maybe, maybe we can try a $2,000 ad and we get, you know, 9,000 back. And we just, the, the, the basics and it really was the basics. I love it. I love it. And and the next endeavor, direct hit, 500 days, $500 million acquisition. And obviously it's not just about the money, but it's, it's also the impact. But, but that, that makes me think a lot about, about your presentation, speed as the primary business strategy. You're coming from an industry where you're saying that, you know, it's not necessarily moving the fastest. You're an early young entrepreneur out of MIT and Harvard. Where, what is this thinking process behind speed as the primary business strategy? What does that even mean to you? Um, well, I mean, I think speed brings a lot of advantages. Um, uh, first of all, you can, it's easier to attract people to join your adventure when you can point to how fast you're moving. Um, like one of the companies was, it was an instant messenger for PC video gamers. And if we could say, you know, in the, in a, uh, a month ago, we gained in the past month, you know, we gained, 2 million new users the month before that we gained a million new users that gets people to say wow i want to join your company or when you're raising money if you can show those kind of statistics it's easier to raise money um, when you're getting press to cover you it's easier to get the press to cover you it's also tougher for your competition to keep up with you i mean we had competitors right. who were releasing we were releasing a new a new version of the product um basically every two weeks every two weeks a new version would come out and some of our competitors were releasing a new version of their product every year. So it was much easier for us at a two week cycle to, to basically just destroy them from a feature comparison standpoint. What does so that I mean think, today to, to, yeah, go ahead. Well, so I think, I mean, I think the speed, you know, brings a lot of advantages from a, co a competitive standpoint. And then you just have to execute in that in everything you do. You have to be fast in hiring people. You have to be fast in, uh, in making decisions, you have to be fast in executing on your marketing, executing on your, you know, your product releases. You just have to, you have to match 
your actions with your strategy. Right. So, so you're really looking at speed as a strategy and not just, a, not just as an advantage, but actually something that, 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 that the leadership of a company should put forward as, as one of their key motivations in, in their day to day. Right. And because, because it, it, it's, it all comes down to culture and, and, and how everybody is aligned towards what are the milestones. Um, I'm, I'm seeing it now within a, a very fast growing company, Hippo, how we're all feeling the pace and everybody's aligned towards the, these, this yeah. amazing mission. And we know that every day counts, which is really incredible. Mike, I have to talk about Project Loon because it's, it's one of my favorite all time projects. I remember seeing the videos of the balloons and, and just thinking about, you know, how creative that is and the impact that it can do. You joined Google to help run it, but tell me a little bit about the motivations behind Project Loon and really all around what it takes to run a moonshot idea like this. Yeah. So Loon was, was a very, very fun, crazy, challenging adventure. Um, when we started on it, pretty much 95% of everyone who heard of it thought it was never going to work and it was crazy. Um, <laughs> we, had to do, we had to do a lot of things. We had to basically shrink uh, a cell tower uh, to be much, much lighter, much smaller, and much use much less power because that's what we're basically putting on a balloon. We had to find ways of, of steering the balloons. And... People didn't think you could right. steer really, uh, you know, these balloons at sixty thousand feet. You could, you didn't have a motor on it, you know, to 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 you know propel it around. But in in the um, in the stratosphere, the wind direction is stratified. So at sixty one thousand feet, the wind might be going five miles an hour east. At fifty nine thousand feet, it might be going twelve miles an hour south. So by just going up and down, you can steer northeast, west, uh, south, and west. And th those little keys to, you know, tactical, whatever design advantages eventually got us to the point where we could launch, you know, a couple dozen balloons from Puerto Rico and two weeks later having them hovering all over a spot of, you know, a few dozen square miles in Peru. Um, and so it was just a series of solving technical, ch technical challenges. I just love that. And give me a little bit of background as to why Project Loon um came about so obviously we're talking about accessibility we're talking about a creative way to provide accessibility uh, for for places in the world can you give me a little bit of context as to how many people still are not don't have access to internet why does google x put so many resources into this crazy creative project yeah um so you know when we were starting something on the order of half of the people in the world didn't have internet access um, wow. you know, you go to Africa, there's a billion people in Africa, only 100 million had internet access. Even when we were starting, even in India, you know, over a billion people, only about a hundred million, uh, had internet access. So there were lots and lots of people who didn't have access. Um, and some of it was very straightforward. Uh, in, in the more urban areas, there were cell towers and it was cost effective for the telephone companies to build cell towers. But a lot of times in the more rural areas, it was not cost effective. And a lot of people in the rural areas just didn't have cell towers. Um, so that was kind of the thinking. And then, of course, all the things, all the benefits the Internet brings, you know, weather reports right. and education and medical information and, and, and commerce. Um, so that, that was kind of the driver behind the idea. That, that, that's incredible. And now you're coming in to Project Loon. You've, you've had, I believe, four startups behind you working in other, in other companies previously. And now you're running a team that it's not really clear whether this is going to succeed. There is no crazy, no, there is no profit at the end of the day that you're marking on the board to know your growth. You're really solving a huge technical problem that at the end could potentially impact billions of people. What is this? What is the leadership mindset that you have to take into this that is perhaps either different or similar to your previous endeavors? Um, well, I mean, I still believed that that moving very quickly was the right strategy for Loon. Um, I mean, there's competition in the world. I mean, you can just look around today. You see um, multiple satellite um, constellations, right. uh, you know, SpaceX is uh, Starlink, uh, you know, OneWeb, um, you know, Telesat has announced one, uh, Amazon has announced one. Um, so yeah, they're trying to do similar things, bring internet to many people. So you gotta, you gotta move to beat the competition. Um, but also you got to move quickly just to avoid, I don't know, the project kind of petering out. If it goes on too many years without success, 
you know, Google might decide they don't want to continue to fund it. People on the team might decide it's not interesting enough. They might drift off the team. So I think there's still advantages or necessity in many cases to um, to moving quickly, even even in a you know corporate environment like that. Right. And uh, in 2017, you go back to uh, to the entrepreneurial days, creating a new venture, Apollo Fusion, uh, again in in the aerospace field. Why leave VP at Google, a dream position that you know millions of people want? You've had these experiences before, right? You know what it's like being an entrepreneur. People say that you have to be crazy to be an entrepreneur. Why go and create a new venture? Uh, I mean, I just love the camaraderie of the, the startup environment. And I love the, um, you know, the small team, uh, you know, we have 20 people now at, at Apollo Fusion. I just love that sort of size. Um, and, uh, it's, it's more what I'm used to is sort of a small, small team, right. small company. Um, yeah, it's been more, more what I'm used to. So, so what's the mission? Because also Apollo Fusion is trying to solve some pretty, some pretty incredible problems that are extremely relevant to 2020, especially what we've seen with, with environmental changes. Um, yeah, I, I, it's very fun time to be in the space business. Um, it's kind of like the second space boom, you know, space renaissance or something. The, the 60s, right. very exciting with the Apollo program and a lot of attention focused on it. I think over a few decades, kind of, the interest kind of died down a little bit. You know, the space shuttle program ended. Um, right. You know, it got to be kind of bogged down. But some of the things we mentioned before, like, you know, with, with, with SpaceX being able to, you know, offer a much cheaper payload, uh, you know, dollars per kilogram to orbit, um, with, you know, using very you know, cell phone type technology to make small satellites. You know, you talk about, you know, the inertial measurement unit inside a cell phone. You can use that on a satellite. Yeah, uh, you can use a CPU from a cell phone. You can use that on a satellite. So you can drive the cost of the satellites down. The the, the cost the launch cost is going down. And there's a lot of uses, right? There's the internet bringing communication uses, but there's also Earth observation. You know, a lot of people are interested in, uh, you know, using the satellites to, um, you know, track where, you know, uh, forests are getting burned or where there's illegal fishing going right. on. Or you can, you know, detect. Um, climate change and, or, or from a, you know, uh, from a competitive standpoint, you can, you can measure sort of what's going on in the competitive landscape and you can use that information, uh, to, to, to make your company faster and better. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Mike, I have, you know, going over this incredible journey, uh, you know, most of the people that are watching this are, are young entrepreneurs, young engineers that are, are excited to go on their journey. One of the things that I mentioned that I'm incredibly inspired by is, is solving really difficult problems that, that have a huge impact, potential huge impact later on. What are some insights that you've gained over the years that you would tell either yourself as a young entrepreneur or, or other young, you know, hungry entrepreneurs that are, that are just thinking about how to get started? What, what are some really main things that you, that you would keep in mind? Yeah. So it was either Larry or Sergey who once pointed out to me that, um, you know, all, all startups are going to be very hard. So if they're all going to be hard, why don't you go after something big? you know, anyway, which I, at first I was like, that's kind of crazy, but it's, I think it's kind of true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, um, I, I think I'm really a big fan of, you know, focusing on the right general industry to be in, you know, like, uh, in the, in the eighties, you want to be in, you know, personal computers, you know, in the, in the, late nineties, you want to be in the internet type businesses, you know, right now you might want to be in the space business, or you might want to be in, you know, CRISPR or biotech or something like that. So focus on the right space to be in, you know, whatever is a rising tide ri rises all ships or whatever. Um, but then also, uh, you know, four out of the five companies I had had to change direction from the original, the original idea. So um, maybe I'm not so good at picking the first idea, but, but putting together a really, you know, cl you know, a plus team that can pivot quickly and get in the right space get get started and i'm always encouraging entrepreneurs get started get a good team together start out put your whatever your whatever your your prototype out there your in your, what do you call it the um, um initial um product whatever MVP, um yeah. put it out there and get feedback. yeah um get get feedback and then adjust and that happened four out of five times we got feedback saying that's the wrong direction but by the way 
near near what you're doing there's something that's much more interesting and so shift over to that near, near thing so yeah i definitely encourage entrepreneurs to to do that 100 percent. I, I love the mentality i see i see quite a few people that are get get so excited about this idea they, they do get an a plus team but then they run off for about a year year and a half perfecting that idea only to realize that there are some really dramatic pivots because they never had any some any any initial validation but by providing this you know 50 percent mvp to the world and prototyping just to see reactions and pivoting quickly saves so much time and, and obviously capital mike thank you so much for for being here this is uh, so great to, uh, to have you and thank you for being generous with your time before we leave i have to ask the most important question which is three words that you would use to describe yourself uh okay number one is tenacious um I think it was um, Thomas Edison who said, if, you fa if you're faced with like failure again and again, what's the surest way to succeed is to always be willing to try just one more time. And it seems like a little, whatever, a little simple thing. But if you think about it, it's kind of true, right? I mean, if you're always being willing to try it just one more time, uh, then you'll never by definition fail. Um, the second one, I guess, would be optimistic. I mean, I think other people have said this. I think it's a it's a very characteristic trait of entrepreneurs that they're irrationally optimistic. I think I'm definitely irrationally optimistic. Um, but you know, you kind of need that to to do to be an entrepreneur. One hundred percent. Yeah, it's good. And then the last one, I think maybe be open. Um, I'm very open at the company. I tell the team when things are going great and when they're not going great. But at least that way, they believe me. I think it's a it's a bad CEO trait to right. always be saying everything's great and then nobody believes you. So you got it. You got to be open and tell people you know what's going on. Yeah. Mike, thank you very very much. Uh, this was this was phenomenal. I can't wait to follow Polo Fusion some more and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you for having me and uh, say hi to your dad for me. Okay, bye bye. <laughs>